recording. Yeah, that, you know, whether you want to or not. Try not to double us on blackjack in a week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the vegetables in the week. Yeah, there's, there's an actual vegetarian tray even, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always leftovers. Also. Usually have dinner on Monday with this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going to need to cook for yourself. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, let's just give folks a few minutes yeah. to join. I think they'll probably make you more. Making the way down. Should go into the room hacks. I get some more suggestions in there for me. So, did you? Yeah, they were sort of tongue in cheek and joking, but that comes with the issue. I mean, Opportunity to rename a room is rare, right? We should put it in. Yeah. Yeah. So. The question is to what extent it sticks. Like, mm-hmm. you the back of buy in. You know what I mean? Like, not just your number. Where do we put it in this there? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You're just in the map. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, like, there's all kinds of like kind of funny biological based names that we could come up with, but like a lot of them would be would make them would name like best, <laughs> which is the whole one. You know what I mean? Yeah, the yellow spot in the middle. Yeah, mm-hmm. believe it or not, the box behind the title is, is dark gray. Oh, no way. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Not blue? Not blue? Is there like a mechanism that has to be about that? Because this is an AHEC room. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Just call and ask for help with the director. But they'll probably let it go over it. No, I just want them to replace it. Yeah, that thing looks pretty old. You can like, yeah. I think there is a, there's like, um, I forget how it works necessarily, but they like keep track of it over the course of the year. Yeah. And then reconcile it with the university later. But like, that's not a problem. So right. That. Well, this is specifically an AI for Venice series. Oh, is it? So it's shared. It's not a So it shouldn't matter. Yeah, unless it ain't. Let's see if it'll refund us our clean budget. Oh, you're gonna pay for that, didn't you? Ten bucks an hour. That's it. Okay. It goes, it goes higher than the more people, thirty people. Probably don't have that number because we're like a shared campus. Yeah. It just means if you're gonna provide food, so you're not providing food. Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Practically. If you order the food through the department, then you have to tell the truth. But like, if you, yeah. If you're bringing cookies that you make, slide. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's get started. Um, so, joining us today is Yantina Taxpias, a uh, new postdoc in the Raglan lab. Um, she, you just finished your PhD, right? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. Um, and that was at the University of Western Ontario. She did her master's at Dalhousie University uh, in. Uh, uh, Nova Scotia, right? Yeah. Um, she's received numerous awards, more than I'm going to list here, but her CV makes me feel bad. Um, and uh, <laughs> lots of public, <laughs> uh, lots of publications, um, places like Biological Reviews, Journal of Experimental Biology, BMC Genomics, and others. Um, today she'll be talking to us about some of her PhD work uh, in a talk, Life in the Frozen Lane, Mechanisms Underlying Freeze Tolerance in the Springfield Cricket. So please join me in welcoming Yantina. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, people, for coming. Uh, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, as Scott said, going to chat a little bit about my dissertation work today. And where this work starts is something you can probably relate to, which is winter is a tough time of year. I mean, we can do fun things, we can go skiing, um, we can enjoy centralized heating, but if you're an insect, that is not really an option for you. You don't see butterflies going skiing. Um, and so there's a relatively short summer, right, during which insects can do what they want to do and, and various organisms. But um, that winter is a long, cold time of their life, and they have to deal with those low temperatures if they're going to live in places like here, right, or anywhere in temperate North America. And as I'm sure you all know, um, insects are ectotherms, right? Their body temperature reflects out of the environment. So if we start to cool the environment down, uh, as you could do for, say, this, this willow leaf beetle here, um, the insect cools down, right? And at some point below zero degrees Celsius, we see this outflow, uptick in temperature to a cooling point, which indicates that beetle is starting to freeze. Is when ice forms, it releases, releases heat. And you probably don't need to read any scientific papers to know that ice forming inside your body is a problem, right? It kills most organisms, uh, whether you're a cool insect or not. And so for insects that live in areas like this, we have to deal with uh, temperatures below zero degrees Celsius. There are a few options, right? Some animals avoid it completely, right? You've probably heard of monarchs, which migrate south for the winter, like some humans. Um, there are many insects that avoid freezing. So this um, beautiful beetle is, is a pest throughout uh, a lot of North America, and its overwintering stage can keep its body, its body fluids liquid even at temperatures like minus 20 degrees Celsius. Um, but then, uh, which is cool, you know, they don't have to worry about ice, um, they do have to deal with cold. But my favorite group of insects are the ones that tolerate freezing. So they tolerate ice formation in their body, and I have some very some beautiful um, examples here. I'm really not, not beautiful to everybody. Um, but we have the New Zealand alpine weta here, which can handle over 80% of its body water turning into ice, uh, which is one of the highest we've ever recorded. Um, I mean, me generally, not, not me. Um, this critter in the middle is a fly larva, Chamomyza castata. They're related to uh, Drosophila. And these guys can survive in liquid nitrogen, uh, so minus 197 degrees Celsius. And this wood roach on the end here can survive being frozen for a really long time, uh, over half a year, right? So 
these are some really extreme examples of how life survives in um, very challenging situations. When I learned about priest tolerance five years ago at a conference, and I thought to myself, man, that's cool. I want to dedicate four years of my life to this question of how insects survive freezing. Um, so if we're going to do that, there are a few ways to approach the question. And freeze tolerance, we've known about it for about 200 years, uh, although research efforts have been sort of really in the last 50 years or so. And a lot of those research efforts are, oh, I'm skipping ahead. Never mind. Um, besides it being cool, why why should you care about how insects survive freezing? Um, studying extremophiles is, is kind of a neat way to understand how life works in general, right? Um, and and from a you know a, a more practical perspective, we know winters are changing. Um, they're expected to get warmer, um, less snow cover. We see this. Uh, rise in predicted surface temperature over the next 100 years in, in uh, overwintering areas. And what that can mean for an insect out there is, um, in some cases, warmer climates, they may not freeze. But with less snow, that's less insulating um, ground cover, so they may freeze more often. And we expect more variable temperatures, so there may be more freeze thaw events. And if we want any hope of trying to understand how life is going to respond to these changes, we need to understand the basic biology. Uh, so um, that's my <laughs> justification of why I'm studying this very cool phenomenon. Um, if we if we want to better understand freeze tolerance, a lot of um, a lot of the places we start are descriptive studies, right? So for example, you can Take your, take your insect of uh, choice. This is the goldenrod gallfly. They overwinter as maggots inside the, the stems of goldenrod plants. And they are not freeze tolerant in the rout, right? Most things only become freeze tolerant as winter approaches. So what you can do is measure various molecules over time. So this is from just September to December, all the way um, through to May. And you can see what happens as we change from a freeze intolerant animal to a freeze tolerant animal. So in this case, these flies are accumulating glycerol and sorbonol, two small molecules that are thought to be cryoprotectants, or molecules that help protect um, cells in, in uh, low temperatures and in the presence of ice. So this is nice. This is something that suggests to us that you know, these cryoprotectants correlate with freeze tolerance. They may be important. And if you do enough of these studies, then you can compare among species, right? So if we take some of the more well-studied freeze tolerant insects, as we have our New Zealand alpine weather here, our favorite flies, uh, and the woolly bear caterpillar. Do you guys get that here? They're very cute little orange and orange and black fuzzy caterpillars. Okay, well, I will bring some in sometime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so these, um, if you compare, say, these cryoprotective molecules, um, so glycerol and sorbitol and polyols, right, and sugars. Um, we have amino acids and ice nucleators, which can um, control when and where ice forms. And if we just compare whether these are present in these in this diverse group of pre-sporn insects, um, we don't see a really convincing pattern, right? So um, our most our, our fly that can survive liquid nitrogen doesn't accumulate any polyols or sugars. Um, whereas, you know, these other ones do, right? And so there's no um, no magic molecule that always is associated with freeze tolerance. And if we add in freeze avoidance species, which don't survive internal ice, they accumulate a lot of the same molecules. So the descriptive approach is important, of course, uh, it's a place to start, but we can't really make generalizations about how insects are surviving freezing, uh, even based on these comparisons. So um, my favorite kind of way to study this is functional studies, where you manipulate lab, uh, organisms in the lab. And this has not been done very often in freeze tolerance. It's standard in lots of, in lots of areas, right? Um, the one, the, good, uh, the most common model for this is this, uh, this fly, it survives very low temperatures. And uh, Vlad Koshnil's lab in the Czech Republic has done some very cool work on these guys. If you feed these larvae lots of proline, which is another potential cryoprotectant, um, they survive freezing better. So 
I'm going to do that probably 50 more times. Um, you have a nice functional study here where, you know, if you don't feed them much proline, uh, they don't survive freezing super well, but if you feed them lots of proline, they do. So this is, this is more convincing evidence that we have a molecule that does something in freeze tolerance. Uh, and then, you know, you can do further up studies to figure out um, exactly what protein is doing. So, unfortunately, these studies are very few and far between. Um, this is the main lab that was doing this before I started my PhD. And so, um, I came in to try to work with another, another freeze tolerance model to add to the tools we've got here. So, this handsome critter is a spring field cricket, Bill Salidas. And it, its distribution overlaps with where I did my PhD, um, although not where we are now. And um, this project started kind of coincidentally. We had these, we were using these crickets in the lab anyway for other projects. And then Laura Ferguson here puts them outside for an overwintering project. They froze, and she thought, oh crap, I just killed all my crickets, but they survived. Um, so we, put, you know, she figured out they were freeze tolerant. Um, and then Zander McKinnon came along and did his master's to make sure we could work with that freeze tolerance in the lab. Um, so these guys overwinter in a freeze tolerant state. This stage here uh, is a late in-star juvenile, so just, just before they would become adults. So they overwinter like this, and then in the spring, they mold into adults and, and they sing in the spring, which is what we call them the spring field. So how do we work with these guys in the lab? We've got, well, if you look at what's happening outdoors in their native habitat during the fall, um, this is temperature from early October to early January. And we see that temperature is decreasing, right, over the late weeks. And we know day length is decreasing as well. So if we want free to our crickets in the lab, we just have to mimic this. Um, so we can keep our crickets under two conditions. Control conditions, which is just our rearing conditions in red, long days, warm temperatures, those crickets are freeze intolerant. Uh, but if we transfer those juveniles to an incubator that decreases temperature and day length over six weeks, we can make them freeze tolerant. Uh, and they're easy to tell apart in the lab because they wear these different hats. Um, no. We call this a toque in Canada. I mean, what, what, do, what do Americans call it? Hats. Like a winter hat. Just a winter hat? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Good to know they exist. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a little bit more of a complicated when people talk about lab affirmations, usually they're not talking about this much change, but we actually have to do this gradual change to get freeze tolerance. We so mimic the, the external environments as, as much as we can. Um, and then these freeze tolerant crickets. They survive moderate freezes. So they're, um, I talked about all these examples at the beginning of very extreme cases. These guys, they survive being frozen at temperatures above minus 12. Uh, so if you cool them below minus 12, that's their lower lethal temperature, they don't recover. And they can survive being frozen for about a week at minus eight. So not, um, not an incredible example of extreme freeze tolerance, but we can hear lots of them in the lab. They're nice and big, easy to work with for insects um, and uh, we can compare these two groups of crickets from the same cohort and we can look at where freeze tolerance fails. So it's, it's a nice system. Um, they also, we can also do work with tissue level. So if we want to see what freezing does to insect cells, we can breathe in the cricket um, and and then ex uh, extract its fat body cells, uh, which are easy to work with and very amenable to live dense dating. So I can freeze a cricket and then see how many of its cells survive freezing, uh, just with some microscopy. And so what we've got here is the proportion of alive cells. And in crickets that were never frozen, their cells are nice and healthy, as you expect. But if we take a freeze intolerant cricket in red and freeze it, its cells will survive. And if we take a freeze tolerant cricket and freeze it to a moderate treatment of minus eight, it sells to okay. Right? Until we take that freeze tolerant cricket and freeze it to its lethal temperature or lethal time. So we have a nice case of the, the cell survival actually mirrors the whole animal survival. And we can also do this ex vivo, um, which means taking those fat body cells out of the cricket and freezing them in an artificial um, medium to look at cell death. 
without having to, to freeze lots of carbons. And we see very, very similar results um, in terms of the difference between freeze intolerant and freeze tolerant carbons and what happens at the cellular lethal limits. Okay. So freeze tolerant crickets are obviously doing something that freeze intolerant crickets are not. And to talk through um, what those crickets are doing, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of theory about freeze tolerance um, and then talk about some descriptive and functional experiments I did with these guys and wrap it up. So freeze tolerance, like I said, the, the real research efforts have only been in the last 50 years or so. And there's actually still a lot of hypothesis about how freeze tolerance works. There's a lot we haven't figured out. But our current model is um, we're going to think about in terms of a, a cell in a cricket. So this temperature trace here is what's happening to an insect as we cool it down, it freezes, and we form back up. And the cell here is surrounded by hemolin for insect blood. And these, there are little ozolites in the, in the cell and you look, right? Salts, sugars, that sort of thing. Uh, and when we start to cool that insect down, that low temperature is already in stress, right? Before we even hit freezing, um, low temperatures kill most insects way before ice forms. Uh, then we get the bulk of ice formation and the potential for mechanical damage, because when ice forms, it expands, and it expands in the wrong place that ends up creating toast. Um, that ice continues, that can form inside or outside the cells. I'm just showing outside because that's a, the more common example. And when that happens, we are locking up ice, water in, in the ice, right? Um, so there's a bit of a dehydration stress on those cells. And when an insect is frozen, you would think it's carb reserved and nothing's happening. That's kind of that's how I used to think about freezing anyway. But frozen insects can still actually metabolize. They can still release CO2. They can get build up of various um, products in their cells. So there's the potential for some metabolic injury um, with build up of um, harmful metabolites over time, which may be why freeze tolerant insects have a lethal time. And then that's not the end of the story because we've got to warm that insect back up. Um, when the ice melts, there's more potential for, for damage, especially if water is re-entering cells really quickly. Um, and a lot of free solar insects are not ready to get up and going right after you sell them out. Some of them do. Some of them are like, oh, no more ice, I'm good to go. Um, but many of them have a recovery period. You can't even tell if they survive until a day or two after their freeze trip. So there, there's something going on with that, with recovery in many of these guys. So if we want to, now this is all hypothesis, right? It's just based on what we understand about physics and biochemistry and, and a little bit of experimental data. So if an insect is going to survive freezing, it should be able to deal with these hypothetical challenges. And so there are sort of five main mechanisms uh, that we think are important. Controlling when and where ice forms probably seems <laughs> fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, Minimizing the amount of ice that forms, so you can reduce that uh, dehydration challenge. Um, oh, stabilizing cells and macromolecules by, there are, there are a few options that we'll get into, um, which can help deal with all sorts of stress, right? To help deal with the dehydration stress or maybe the metabolic injury. Um, we know lots of overwintering insects suppress the metabolism, which could also help deal with that potential metabolic injury. And some freeze tolerant insects are going to need mechanisms to coordinate that repair and recovery. So, what I wanted to do with my cricket was first of all see if there was any evidence for those mechanisms. So, we measured a whole bunch of things. Um, I got some help on, on some, some of these areas. So, Curtis Turtle and Thomas Stetna did some respirometry on these crickets. And um, this is this is probably my least favorite graph in the presentation. I need to change it. But um, <laughs> each line here is a cricket. We've measured how much CO2 that cricket is producing at five degrees and fifty degrees. Um, and so, you know, it should be higher at fifty degrees than five, which it is for most of these crickets. And we see that freeze tolerant crickets tend to have a lower 
metabolic rate of increase in children. So they are suppressing the metabolic rate, uh, which we which we hoped would be true. Um, they also increase the temperature at which they freeze. So a freeze intolerant cricket freezes at about minus seven degrees Celsius. A freeze tolerant one freezes at about minus six, and that doesn't seem like a big difference. Um, but that elevation of the supercooling point indicates that there's probably some control over when and where ice is forming in these freeze tolerant crickets. And if we take out the cricket tissues and hemolymph and see what temperature they freeze at, um, both the hemolymph and the gut have a high supercooling point in freeze tolerant crickets. So that might be where they are maybe accumulating ice nucleating agents to control where ice forms. Um, so this is a pattern that's been seen in lots of freeze tolerant insects before, this elevation of supercooling point. Um, so we thought, well, why don't we take freeze intolerant crickets and force them to freeze at a higher temperature? And you can do that. You can buy commercially available ice nucleating agents. Um, we fed them to crickets, we injected them into crickets, we put them on the cricket um, surface. And not, none of those were sufficient to turn a freeze intolerant cricket freeze tolerant cricket. So that's not saying this isn't important for freeze tolerance, but it's certainly not sufficient for freeze tolerance. Um, we also had a closer look at the hemolymph of these crickets. So freeze tolerant crickets have a higher osmolality in their hemolymph. They've got more solutes, right? So more stuff. This is useful because the more stuff that's in your hemolymph, the less ice can form, right? If you put salt water in the freezer, you'll get less ice than if you put pure water in the freezer. Um, now, these guys don't actually differ in terms of their salt composition. Um, we measured um, sodium, potassium, and sort of inferred the amount of chloride that was there as the, the anion, and those are the same between these two groups. So to figure out what was different, what was accounting for this increase, um, if I do a bit of travel, uh, I went to the Czech Republic to work with Vlad Koshtal for, uh, for a few months to do some metabolomics. And so this lab is really nice to set up to quantify over 50 small metabolites, sugars, amino acids, alleles, um, and we did that in human and fat body tissue. And I'm going to show a quick summary of that um, in a principal components analysis form. Sorry about the, especially sorry about the colors here. But there's, there's two things to take away from this, because um, I know looking at PCA is, is nobody's favorite thing to do. Um, but <laughs> this, this encompasses the data from all 50 of those metabolites, and each dot is a cricket sample. And all my blue dots here are crickets that were either halfway or all the way through acclimation, and on this side we've got crickets that were held under those control conditions for zero to 50 plus six weeks. And we see these two groups separate out, so their hemolymph does have different metabolite composition and freeze tolerant crickets relative to freeze intolerant. And we see something similar in the tissue, in the fat body tissue. And what seems to be driving this difference, which is what I'm interested in, is the accumulation of these three molecules, proline, trialose, and myelinoxetol, all of which are potential cryoprotectants. And if we look at uh, just at one example in more detail, uh, in myelinositol, over these six weeks of control or acclimation conditions, we see an increase in concentration of hemolymph, increased water crickets, and in the tissue. So this is kind of, this is nice. We were hoping to find some cryoprotectants, uh, although it's a little unusual to accumulate um, so many different types. Uh, but if we put these guys into our graph, um, we see it accounts for at least some of the, some of the difference in osmolality. And the rest of the unidentified stuff is for the next um, sucker or I know, grad student to figure <laughs> out. Uh, if, 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 someone, if someone continues this. Um, so if we come back to our mechanisms, uh, I cut out the recovery one because none of my experimental designs of, address that mechanism. But we have evidence that I'm going to keep track of in progress bias for each of these mechanisms. Right? We have um, this elevation of supercooling point that can help control ice. We have increased hemolymph osmolality that would reduce ice content a little bit. Um, 
we have the accumulation of pearly trailers and myonositol, which could help stabilize cells, and we have this suppression of metabolic rate. Now, this is all descriptive, right? Whether any of these actually contribute to freeze tolerance requires some more study, and, and a lot needs to be confirmed. You know? It'd be good to actually measure some ice content uh, in these crickets, for example, and that's a project that's ongoing in, in the lab of the PhD. In. But I'm going to focus in on what I can test during my PhD, which is the role of these cryoprotectors. So, like I said, these are often associated with freeze tolerance and freeze avoidance. And the simple question you can ask here is whether any of these molecules confer freeze tolerance. So if we take a freeze intolerant cricket, artificially elevate its cryoprotectin concentrations, can we make it freeze tolerant? And the way you do this is you get very good at injecting crickets stuff, uh, which is not too bad because, like I said, they're pretty big for insects. And so I can inject solutions of trailos and myonostol and proline and other things, freeze them to a moderate freeze treatment, like minus eight, uh, and see whether they can also survive freezing. And I can do this for the whole animal, and I can also do it at the cellular level um, because I can take fat body from freeze intolerant crickets, um, bathe it in extra cryoprotectives, and see how well those cells survive under this treatment. So the short answer to this question is, um, no, trailers, proline, and myonostol do not confer freeze tolerance. I'll show you the, the data to support that wonderful negative result. Um, this is the amount of crickets that survive freezing when they're ejected with a control vehicle, so nothing interesting. Any of the crowd protectives or a combination of all three, right? So the crickets don't survive. Um, I did inject a few other molecules just to, to test a couple of peripheral hypotheses, but also to see if my method could work. Um, and glycerol, which my crickets don't accumulate, but lots of other freeze tolerant insects do, did allow a small number of crickets to survive freezing. Um, so none of the crab protectants that crickets actually accumulate are sufficient for freeze tolerance, but it is possible to add glycerol and make a cricket freeze tolerance sometimes. If we look at the cellular data, the story is the same. We get very low cell survival unless glycerol is present. So at this point, we wanted to know, do cryoprotectants do anything in my freeze tolerant crickets? And we can, we can use a similar experimental design. We take a freeze tolerant cricket that's already been acclimated and see if we can make it survive, if we, we can make it more freeze tolerant. Right, they can survive lower temperatures or for longer times. Um, again, by injecting cryoprotectants, and we can do the same thing with the cells. Here, we are now freezing crickets. We're working with freeze tolerant crickets, so we've got to freeze them to a treatment they wouldn't normally survive, which would be their lower lethal temperature or lethal time. And this is where it gets interesting, because each of these cryoprotectants does something. Um, if we look at the whole animal data, um, in solid circles, oops, we've got crickets frozen to their lower lethal temperature and in the open circles, their lethal time. And what we see is if we inject proline or trailose or glycerol, we see an improvement in survival under at least one of these lethal treatments. And if we look at what's happening with the cells, it's a slightly different story. In this case, myonositol, trailose, and glycerol are having a positive impact under at least one of the lethal treatments. So these cryoprotectants can function in freeze tolerant crickets. They can help improve survival, um, but perhaps can only do so alongside the other changes that happen during acclimation when that cricket is becoming freeze tolerant. Um, one of the sort of interesting side pieces to this is like I said, it's a little weird to have multiple cryoprotectants, and none of them at super high concentration. Um, certainly not as high as we see in, in some other freeze tolerant insects. And if we just summarize quickly what these cryoprotectants did, so in whole crickets or their cells at the lethal temperature or lethal time, a check mark is going to indicate that molecule improved survival. Right? And we see that each pattern is different, right? Um, Trailos seems to work most of the time, um, but proline and myonositol improve survival under fairly restricted circumstances, which suggests these cryoprotectants may actually be doing different things from each other. 
Um, and when we use a combination of all three, it improves survival every time, but no more than a crowd protected dog on its own, right? So the combination of all three crowd protected here is no better than trailers by itself. So this is kind of a, this is, this is one of my favorite findings for my dissertation because for a long time people have assumed that these small metabolites are kind of interchangeable and the insect just makes whatever is convenient um, based on its, you know, its biochemical pathways that are active. But they may actually be um, engaging in unique functions and I hope that that's, that's followed up in, followed up on because I think that's a cool, cool place to feel people go. So we do have, we can now add to this progress bar that we know carbotectins are helping protect cells, at least in some cases, right? Um, but there are other changes in acclimation that are probably important. To get at those, uh, I did some transcriptomics. So um, what we're working with here is a fried egg at the bottom. I uh, know, I sell. Um, but when people talk about gene expression, everyone has a slightly different definition. So here I'm talking about um, transcribing mRNA from, from a gene of interest and that mRNA being translated into protein. And we, if we um, take crickets at different time points, uh, zero, three, and six weeks of control or acclimation conditions, um, I extracted their fat body, and took the, took the RNA from that, sent that away from RNA, for RNA sequencing to get a snapshot of all the mRNA that's in those fat body cells at those times. And then I can, of course, compare control and the crickets to see what freeze tolerant crickets are doing differently. Um, I'm not going to show a bunch of raw analysis uh, from this because unless anybody, if anyone wants to see it later, we, we can talk about it. Um, but because we're working with three time points and not a standard pairwise comparison, the first thing I did was, um, with the help of Laura B. Marco, um, was try and cluster these potential genes in my transcriptome into patterns based on their expression, or into cluster them based on their expression pattern. So um, what we've got here are nine clusters, and no individual one is particularly important, but I'll just go through one. So if we look at cluster, cluster A, we've got 618 potential genes, and their expression in control crickets doesn't change very much, Right, but it decreases in activated crickets in blue. And so um, we have various patterns. Sometimes it increases in activated crickets, or sometimes it does the same thing for groups. Um, and one of the kind of interesting super patterns, I guess, is in these top six panels, we see a change, a big change really early in activated crickets, so from zero to three weeks, and then very little change afterwards. And in these bottom three panels, we see more of a continual change over those six weeks. And within these clusters, there, there may be genes that are important for freeze tolerance, um, but the timing of their expression differs, right? So here we have early gene expression that may be important for freeze tolerance, and um, gene expression that's continually changing that may be important for freeze tolerance. But all of that is, is not very useful until you know, well, what are the genes in those clusters? All right, so we did some goterm enrichment analysis, some head pathway analysis. Both of these analyses cluster these putative genes based on shared functions or, or roles in the cells or organisms. And I pulled out from both of these analyses three big themes of changes in gene expression that may be important for freeze tolerance. One is this reduced metabolic activity. So we already know um, freeze tolerant crickets suppress their metabolic rate relative to control crickets or freeze intolerant crickets. And we saw some downregulation of metabolic enzymes or that could support this. Uh, I also saw downregulation of genes involved in DNA replication and cell cycle that could induce or, or reduce the amount of cell cycle activity, which could help um, contribute to this lower metabolism. Right, so there seems to be somewhat of a shutdown uh, metabolically, which we expected. Um, we also saw upregulation of a bunch of lipid biochemistry enzymes that could alter membrane composition. 
and differential expression of cytoskeletal genes that could change the composition or the stability of the cytoskeleton. And both of these, so these types of changes show up in lots of transcriptomic studies. Um, so there's a pinch of, pinch of salt to be, to be used when interpreting these data. Um, but if these changes are important for freeze tolerance, they could help make sure that membranes are protected at low temperatures and help make sure that the cytoskeleton retains its form at low temperatures. Because we know that freezing in low temperatures will um, make a cytoskeleton depolarize. It's not very good for the cell. And we saw some changes that could just generally help protect cells and macromolecules. So some sort of indirect evidence for changes in gene expression that can help promote crab protection production, although nothing direct. We didn't see an upregulation in the enzyme that produces trailos or anything um, very clear like that. Um, but we did see very clear upregulation of trailos transporters. So this is important because trailos, like any sugar, can't just cross cell membranes by itself. So if, for example, the fat body is making a lot of trailos, but the animal needs to protect all the cells in its body, that trailose transporter can help the trailose get out of that fat body cell into the hemo, help protect all the cells in the body. Um, I saw upregulation of each of 70, which could help um, minimize protein damage at low temperatures, and I saw upregulation of some antioxidants that could help combat um, oxidative stress at low temperatures, or um, so contribute to reducing the metabolic injury. And after this transcriptomics, um, we're in a similar place we were with, with any descriptive study, right? Um, although I'm going to add one, one more thing to it, um, which I'll explain in a second. But basically, we've got a bunch of descriptive evidence, right? That, you know, we have some cryoprotecting transporters and heat shock proteins that can help protect macromolecules. Um, we've got all these changes in gene expression that could alter the composition of the cell itself, potentially change membrane and cytoskeletal composition. Um, and we've got this down block, uh, down, down regulation of metabolic processes. But again, it's you know these things may be important for increased tolerance. Um, we need to explore that further to figure it out. Right? And um, to do so. Um, to figure out which genes and processes are important for freeze tolerance, we can do RNA interference. So you guys all familiar with how this works? Approximately? Okay, I never know whether to actually do this. Um, but okay, we've got normal gene expression in the cell here, right? If that cell encounters double-strand RNA, uh, it degrades it into short interfering RNA, and that siRNA will um, combine with a bunch of proteins to make an RNA and do science and complex that targets any messenger RNA that matches the sequence of the siRNA. So um, what that results in is that mRNA being degraded or at least not translated, and so we, get, we prevent protein production. So this is a thing eukaryotic cells do normally, probably as an antiviral response, because if this was viral double-strand RNA, we could prevent the production of viral proteins, which is good. Uh, as a scientist, we can take advantage of this, right? I can say, hey, I want to prevent expression of a particular gene. I design a double stranded RNA complementary to, to that gene sequence um, and set about injecting some crickets. Um, so the idea here, and we were pretty optimistic about this when I started my PhD because RNAi works pretty well in crickets in general. Uh, it took me a lot longer to get it working than I thought. Um, but hey, that's science. But if you uh, take a freeze tolerant cricket okay, and you reduce expression of some gene of interest that you think is important for freeze tolerance, um, that if it's important for freeze tolerance, it could convert your freeze tolerant cricket to a freeze intolerant cricket. Um, so in this case, I was injecting double stranded RNA, freezing the crickets, um, and ideally seeing if they survived. So the, the point of this being, we can determine you know, which genes and, uh, are necessary for free tolerance and make some inferences about the processes those genes are supporting. And out of that transcriptome screen, there were lots of potential candidates. Uh, I focused in on just a handful to get this method working. And so um, 
I was injecting crickets with the stem strand RNA, waiting three days, extracting RNA from my family, and seeing if I reduced mRNA abundance. Um, I did this using quantitative PCR, reverse transcriptase quantitative PCR. These are my targets. Uh, so ferritin has a potential antioxidant role. And I, so this is looking at the amount of ferritin RNA in fat body cells after I injected double strand RNA. In gray, I've got a control, which shouldn't do anything to our mRNA levels. And then in yellow here, I've got two different double strand RNA constructs. Um, number one did not work. Number two did reduce mRNA, mRNA levels of ferritin. Okay, so that's one, one gene whose expression we have not found. Supervillain, um, I picked because it's involved in the cytoskeleton, but also because it has a cool name. Uh, that would make a great you know, poster title someday. Uh, and I was able to knock that down as well with a couple of double strand RNA constructs. And then trailer's transporter. Um, the expression of this is a lot more variable, as you can see from these error bars. Um, but I was able to. Um, statistically not that down. Well, time will tell if that is, a, if that is real. Um, so here we have the ability to reduce mRNA levels or at least three targets. So the method generally works. This is where I had to stop because I had to come here and post up, uh, <laughs> which, which is a great thing. Um, but um, so there's, there's still some work to be done here. Um, but I'm pretty excited about that work um, because we've shown um, that yes, I can degrade mRNA of target genes. Someone does need to go and check if that alters the protein levels because the protein is what is actually doing its function in the cells. Um, and there's the potential to design lots of other double strand RNAs to target other genes of interest. But um, the, the exciting thing here is that we can then use this to test what's important for tolerance. And no one, if RNAi has been around for a bit, CRISPR has been around for a little less time, but no one has been using these functional genetics tools in pre tolerance at all. So I'm excited for someone to pick this up and see, see where it goes. Um, hopefully that, that part of my PhD hopefully died away. Um, but yeah, so now we have RNAi to further investigate um, these last two mechanisms. I think these top two mechanisms will, will require a little more technological advancement. Studying ice in insects is, is very challenging. Um, but where we end up here is um, there's still some progress to be made, of course, um, but I hope I advance things at least a little bit in my PhD. And ideally, we want to tie those mechanisms to this graph. Now, I didn't make it onto this graph at all in my PhD, right? So that's for, that's for future generations of scientists or maybe me when I have my own lab someday. Um, but I, ideally, we want to link those mechanisms to seeing, you know, hey, if we knock down ferritin, does it actually reduce metabolic injury? And is that important for survival, or is that just a red herring? But this cricket is a good tool to do that uh, and to better understand how, how these kinds of things work. So I'm going to stop talking. These are the people and money that I have to think. Um, and thank you guys for listening. Time for some questions? No pressure, yeah. <laughs> well, I have to ask this because I think it's outside the scope of what the music is, but I'm just curious about where the crickets overwinter in the environment. Well, that's a good question. Um, so, no one has actually gone out and looked, but we believe they do what a lot of other crickets do, which is kind of just hang out under the leaf litter, just sort of on top of the soil. So they don't burrow. Um, and they should, so they could be fairly insulated if they're snow covered, but they may not if there's, there's no snow cover. So that's, that's what we think. Yeah. One day I should actually go out and look. So. Yeah. Sir? What's the role of queuing in all of this? So like you were getting, inducing the freeze tolerance by changing photo period and temperature. Mm -hmm. Is that always what does it across taxa? What happens if you break those associations and, and could the queuing affect what you can get in terms of freeze tolerance? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an awesome question. Um, across taxa, it varies quite a bit. So some insects, 
um, respond more to the temperature or multiple periods, so they don't necessarily need both cues. Um, these crickets do need both cues. So um, I didn't talk about it, but Sander in his master's thesis actually tried like, okay, what if we just decrease photo period or we just decrease temperature? And they don't become freeze tolerant if you only use, if you separate the cues, um, which has some potentially um, negative implications with, you know, as climate warms, yeah, they are yeah, getting yeah. photo period but not temperature cues in nature. Uh, it would be very cool to actually do just temperature and just photo period and, and look at the physiological changes, like see which changes are associated with mm -hmm. which cue. Um, but that's a lot. Yeah, that's something that's certainly not very well characterized for freeze tolerance. It is for a lot of for overwintering insects in general, for diapods, which I'm sure you've heard something about from, from the rival labs. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, um, and it's not clear why, you know, why some insects need both keys and only one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what was the yeah. justification for doing the fat tissue for the kind of Is that common? Uh, easier than whole cricket, I guess it makes sense in some way. Um, so we did want to we did want to use one tissue rather than whole cricket. Not, not really for ease, but because when you if you do the whole whole insect, you're going to miss some things because you could have something that's upregulated in fat body that's downregulated in muscle and it kind of cancels out. Um, so our main reason for using fat body is we, we were also using it for everything else. Um, we, and, and that is because it's easy to work with. It stains well, it's easy to dissect out with that quickly, so you're not like getting sort of weird effects. Um, and it's known to be a very metabolically active tissue that synthesizes carb pregnant. So we figured it would be a good place to look for sort of, yeah, just things related to carb protection in general, but also just as a, a representative tissue. So we didn't catch everything, that's for sure. And we wouldn't have picked up, so for example, coming back to your question of queuing, you know, all that gene expression stuff would have been happening in their tissue probably, right? So we, we definitely missed some stuff there, but it's um it was it was one place to start. Yeah. Do you know what kind of tissue you're using? Do you know anything about like so we talked so we talked a lot about sort of like get gaining this freeze tolerance, right? So do you know anything about like what it looks like when they come out? Like they have to like what do they do with these chemicals? Can they get like tricked out of that freeze tolerance if they're experiencing like variable conditions? Like I was just looking at think about that map and how you had crickets and like Kentucky, like they could go down as far as like Kentucky and Tennessee, but yeah. I imagine the winters they experienced there, like southern Ohio was way different than like northern Montana, right? Yeah, that's true. Um and so and we don't have a good handle on Geographic diversity in this freeze tolerance, it probably it probably exists. Uh, you probably, probably if you compare the Montana cricket to the Kentucky cricket, hopefully the Montana one would be more freeze tolerant. Um, but in terms of yeah, like what happens in the spring, for like well, um, that is something we haven't haven't looked at. There is so there's a there's at least one freeze tolerant insect that loses its freeze tolerance really easily. If you hold it at 20 degrees for two weeks, it's just like, okay, I don't survive freezing anymore. <laughs> um, so some insects are cued out of that freeze tolerance really easily. Um, for these crickets, I'm not sure. And that's something, yeah, it's kind of like not a lot of people are studying diet cost termination, not a lot of people are studying the loss of cold tolerance. But it would be important because if they lose it fairly easily in the spring, but we're getting variable temperatures in the spring, change, like, they're probably going to. Yeah, they need to be able to determine when that risky period is over. Um, but as far as we know, these we're not sure if these guys do a, a true diapause and what cues they're, they're mm -hmm. using um, after. That's a cool question. I mean, that, like, I mean, could that be evidence of why photo period is important potentially early? So that maybe not evidence for it, but an idea for why. Well, that, like, that's certainly it's certainly a more reliable cue. Uh, yeah. Like yeah, a lot of a lot of like more organisms rely on photo period than for sure. Because a, a, a thaw in February doesn't trick you into the wrong season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, 
So that's it. But that, yeah, that's something that we haven't figured out in this model. That'd be cool to see how how robust that freeze tolerance is if you modify with those compliance constraints. Yeah. Other questions? Thanks very much. Oh, thanks. Very much.